This is part two of our discussion of the precise definition of the limit. In a previous video, we saw the pre precise definition of the limit uh, when we were uh, had a two-sided limit, which was finite. And we saw that uh, the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals l provided that for every positive number epsilon there is a positive number delta such that whenever the absolute value of x minus a is between delta and zero then the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon that says informally that we can force f of x to be arbitrarily close to l provided that we restrict x to be sufficiently close to a. So let's look at some examples. Here we're given a function f of x equals 3x minus 1 and uh, the limit value is five, which means that X must be approaching two. And so we're really looking at the limit as X approaches two of three X minus one equaling five. So using the formal definition of the limit, if we choose a value of epsilon, for example, I choose an epsilon, which is one one thousandth, then I should be able to find a value of delta such that whenever the absolute value of x minus two is greater than zero and less than delta, then the function value should be within epsilon of the limit value. So in order to find this value of delta, and since we're given a numerical value for epsilon, we're going to try to find a numerical value for delta. All right, well, let's start with what we're trying to show. As we're trying to show that absolute value of 3x minus 1 minus five should be less than one one thousand. Let's just do a little algebra. I'll combine the like terms. I see I have a common factor of positive three. I'll factor that out of the absolute value sign. And then I can divide both sides of the inequalities by that positive number, one third. And that gives me my candidate for delta. So we have a choice for delta, the one over 3,000, but we've got to show that this delta actually works, meaning that this delta will force the function values to be within one one thousandth of the limit value. All right, so we're going to start with what we just took as our value of delta. We're going to say that uh, suppose that the absolute value of x minus 2 is between 1 over 3,000 and 0. Then, well, let's go back to what we're trying to show. The absolute value of f of x minus l will equal, let's go ahead and repeat the same algebra. And now we have inside the absolute values x minus 2. Well, that's what we have in our hypothesis up here, what we're supposing. And so I can say that, oh, absolute value of x minus 2 should be less than 1 over 3,000. And then the next step is just arithmetic. And that one, 3 times 1 over 3,000 is 1 over 1,000. And that's what we're trying to show. And so what have we shown? Provided that the absolute value of x minus 2 is between 0 
and one over 3,000, then that will ensure that the difference between the function value and the limit value is going to be less than one one thousandth. So let's look at a formal proof. What's the difference between what we just did and a formal proof? Well, in the formal proof, we're not going to have a numerical value for epsilon. We are just going to use the letter epsilon. And we're going to be a little bit more careful with our explanation in what we call the formal proof. But before we can get to the proof, we need to find our delta. So delta is going to be a formula that's going to depend on epsilon. And that's going to ensure that our function value minus the limit value and absolute value is going to be less than epsilon. So we'll start with what we are trying to show. Again, this is preliminary work. All this that I'm doing here is not a proof. It's a preliminary. It's preparing me to write down the proof. All right, so same steps we've seen before. We take the function value minus the limit value, combine like terms. In this case, we can factor out a positive 2. Now, we want that 2 times absolute value of x minus 5 to be smaller than epsilon. So great. Let's have absolute value of x minus 5 less than half epsilon. Now, what am I trying to do? Remember, the absolute value of x minus 5 is what we're trying to, to be make less than delta. And so that's why I want to focus on the absolute value of x minus 5. So now I've got a candidate for my delta. Delta is going to be 1 half of epsilon. So now let's write down the formal proof. So I don't really need this portion about finding the formula. That was really more like the pre preliminary work. So let me go ahead and take that sentence out of my proof. So we're going to start with, suppose epsilon is a positive number. All right. So every limit is proof is going to start with this type of statement. Suppose epsilon is a positive number. Doesn't matter what the function is, doesn't matter what the limit value is. It's going to start with suppose epsilon is a positive number. There's a slight difference um, in the letter that we use when we have an infinite limit. But for finite limits, every limit proof is going to start with this one sentence. Now we say what our value for delta is. We're going to choose delta to be 1 half epsilon. Then whenever, here we're stating the part of the definition, whenever the absolute value of x minus 5 is between delta and 0, It follows that my function minus the limit in absolute value is going to be, well, I repeat the algebra. And now, since I have stated that the absolute value of x minus 5 is less than delta, then I can say that twice absolute value of x minus 5 is less than 2 delta and then I can substitute in my choice of delta. And when I multiply that by 2, I get epsilon. And it's nice to write out a conclusion then. That is, whenever 
the absolute value of x minus five is between zero and delta. Then the absolute value of the function minus the limit value is less than epsilon. So by the definition of the limit, the limit as x approaches five of two x minus one equals nine. And then it's always nice to have some kind of indicator that the proof is finished. People use many different things. It is a style issue, but my favorite professor always used done. And I like that. I think it's very clear. So that's how I'm going to end my proofs with the word done. So let's take a break and look at the precise definition of an infinite limit. Now remember infinite limit, we're only going to look at the one where the limit is positive infinity. It's a very similar definition if the limit is negative infinity. And so well, what's different? Well, again, um, we're still going to assume the function is defined on an open interval containing the number a, but not necessarily a itself. Um, we say that the limit as x approaches a of f of x equals infinity, provided that for every positive number m, there is a positive number delta such that whenever x minus a in absolute value is between zero and delta, then f of x is greater than m. So it's different here is of course we can approach infinity, but going to infinity means that the function value increases without bound. What does without bound mean? It means you think of any number no matter how big eventually the function value is going to be bigger than that. In fact, that's probably a good way to think about infinity is as, not as a fixed number, but as a number which keeps growing. It grows without bound in the positive direction. What about one-sided limits? Well, uh, one-sided limits, we're not going to have a in an open interval the number a is going to be um, the right endpoint if we're approaching from the left. And uh, since we're always going to be approaching from the left, uh, we can just use a minus x instead of the absolute value of x minus a. Because if x is to the left of a, the absolute value of x minus a is a minus x. And then a similar idea if we're looking at the limit from the right. So let's put those two together in our last example. And let's write down a proof that the limit as x approaches zero from the right of one over x equals infinity. So again, we're going to do some preliminary work. This is not the proof. Since it's an infinite limit, we're going to be given a positive number m, capital M, to remind us that it's going to be a big number. We have to find a delta such that whenever x minus zero is less than delta, or simply x is less than delta, then one over x will be bigger than m. All right, so we'll do some algebra. Since x is a positive number and m is a positive number, we don't have to worry about the inequality sign being reversed if we multiply or divide by x or multiply or divide by m. So doing some algebra, we can see that what we want, one over x being greater than m, is equivalent to m times x being less than m, which is equivalent to one over m being greater than x, which really means the same as x being less than 1 over m. So 1 over m is going to be our delta value. So all of that was just preparation for the proof. Let's see if we can write out the proof. So our first sentence, 
suppose m is a positive number. So here with infinite limits, we have m instead of epsilon. Our choice for delta is one over m. So then whenever zero, x is between zero and delta, All right, then that means if x is less than delta, x is less than one over m, which would mean that x times m is less than one, which would mean that m is less than one over x, which means that one over x is greater than m, which is what we're trying to show. And it's just that simple. So it's, but it's good to wrap it up with a conclusion again. That is, if x is between zero and delta, and then uh, one over x is greater than m. And by the definition of the limit, the limit as x approaches zero from the right of one over x is infinity. And we're done. And we're also done with this video.